Hi everyone, welcome to Diabetes Primetime. We have a very special episode for you with dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist, Nicole Patience, about how people with type 2 diabetes can develop a healthy relationship with food. Before we get started, tell me in the comments where you're watching from and let us know if it's your first time joining us. Nicole, thanks so much for being here with us. Thanks for having me, Ansley. So in your experience, what are some of the reasons that developing a healthy relationship with food can be challenging for people with diabetes? Oh, diabetes can make it so hard to, to maintain and preserve a healthy relationship with food, partly because of the stigma that people with diabetes face around diabetes stigma, the, the misconception that someone gave diabetes to themselves, um, also weight stigma, as well as that unrelenting focus on numbers when it comes to diabetes care, A1C, weight, grams of carbohydrates, glucose numbers. It's a, it's a constant stream of numbers that are, are flowing through and that can make it really hard to focus on, on our body and what's happening in our body related to food and eating. So how might someone watching at home know if they have a relationship with food that's maybe gotten a little out of balance? Like what are the clues or signs they should look for? If someone has a relationship with food that's out of balance, one of the things that they might notice is the food rules. Are there rules about when I can eat, what I can eat, what food groups are okay, under what conditions? And sometimes those food rules can creep in and really box someone in. So that can be one kind of red flag if the food rules are becoming a little bit difficult to navigate a food landscape. The other thing is thinking about all the time during the day spent thinking about food, planning food, anticipating food, and time thinking about your body and your body size and shape and you know, checking your body size and shape in, in different ways throughout the day. So if those pieces are taking up a significant portion of your day, it's a sign that your relationship with food might be a, might be out of balance and that if absolutely warrants support in connecting with a dietitian that can that can work to help realign food as only one big and one important area of your life. So I know there's probably a lot of people watching who are saying, Nicole, you know, if I'm not laser focused on food and what I'm eating, you know, I may end up with diabetes complications and I really don't want that. So what would you say to them about how to find that balance? It's a good question. And that is exactly the kind of all or nothing thoughts that can sometimes trip people up. So it, thinking, if I, if I don't think about this, if I don't um, pay attention to every single number, then everything's going to go to ruin and I'm going to experience uh, significant complications that, I, that I'm most concerned about. And really, when it comes to diabetes care, it's a chronic progressive condition. And so we really want to seek that balance and make sure that you are living a healthy, balanced life with diabetes and that diabetes isn't the only front and center piece of, of uh, you know, part of the life of your life. So um, there are lots of ways to live in moderation. And we know that every glucose reading doesn't have to be exactly on target to prevent complications. So there's some wiggle room to experiment with different foods. So we're going to talk a lot about that wiggle room and finding that balance, but first we're going to take a break and do our trivia question. If you answer this question, you will get our new guide to managing emotional eating with advice and tips that can help if you turn to food for comfort. And you will get that guide for free if you answer our trivia question, which is true or false, mindful eating can help us have a better relationship with food. Is that true or false? Can mindful eating help us have a better relationship with food? Put your best guess in the comments and you will get our emotional eating guide delivered to your favorite. Facebook Messenger inbox. So Nicole, let's talk about the good news. If our thoughts about food have become a little imbalanced out of a, a real desire to be healthy with diabetes, is it possible to get back on track? Absolutely. And the first thing is to, in, to recognize that. So if someone, let's say some rules start to crop up, like, oh, I'm not allowed to eat things that I hear frequently, or I'm not allowed to eat any white bread, or I can't have any sweets. And all of a sudden, more and more rules start stacking up and someone might feel a little boxed in of what can I eat? And I'm actually kind of hungry. Um, 
those sort of things can be helpful to be aware of because then it can be a chance to back up and say, where did all this come from? And what are the things that are really going to serve my diabetes care? And what are the pieces that are more fear-based around uh, fear of complications and, and how the, which things have more rigidity and how could I build in some flexibility? So how can working with a dietitian like you kind of help someone start that process of figuring out how to be a little more flexible? Well, when I work with people who are managing diabetes, the first thing we do is take time to um, understand where their own fears are coming in and all of the things that they're already doing to take care of their body um, and their diabetes. And then we work to talk about what are some of the things maybe that that aren't that aren't in their usual food routine, but they kind of miss or that they enjoy or that they want to be able to include or be a part of community around with food. And we talk about ways to help understand their body more through that process. So that would involve uh, sometimes measuring glucose before and two hours after eating a particular food to really understand how it's being impacted or even looking back the next day on how a meal impacted glucose. Because sometimes people are afraid and they say, oh, I don't wanna know what my glucose is. But what happens in that situation is that oftentimes they're sitting in, in that, in that um, fear of glucose, of high glucose that whole time. And it's costing them time and energy, even if they don't know the number. So sometimes having that, that courage um, to get curious and explore how certain foods are impacted can help them feel safer in their body and understand that oftentimes their body can manage um, a food. It may just be a certain time of day where they can manage it, where their, their glucose comes back down after eating it or a certain portion or eating it in combination with other foods. So really what you're talking about is almost doing a series of science experiments where we're checking in pairs and seeing a food that we love that we really want to incorporate into our, our diet. And, and we're seeing, okay, if I eat it in the morning or maybe if I eat it after exercise, we're just seeing how, okay, how can I eat this food in a way that's not going to cause my blood sugar to go higher than my doctor's target for me? That's exactly right. So when someone is checking in pairs, what are they looking for? Like what would tell someone, oh, this meal or this food at this time is a good choice for me? That's a great question. And I just want to reiterate that we wouldn't prick, we, I wouldn't ever recommend someone prick their finger just for the heck of it. We want to be able to have um, that data or that information help to inform choices and guide uh, our behavior. So we would really be checking it as a way of getting curious is I want to know based on my current um, medication, movement, stress, all these other um, constants or things that are present at that moment, how my body's reacting to a certain food and, and using that information to start a conversation perhaps with my medical provider or with the my, my family meal planner and maybe even yourself about, okay, how how is this working for my body? And if it's not working for my body, what other tools do I have access to to help my body um, process that glucose in a way that it brings me into target range? So let's talk about some of those tools. What might someone explore if they're seeing consistently high numbers uh, for a food they, they really do want to be able to enjoy? Sometimes it's just a simple matter of not having enough medication on board. Um, and so making sure that there's flexibility to enjoy those foods and a medication plan to help bring those glucose numbers in target. Of other times, it could be a gentle movement. Um, if before or 15, you know, after eating can be even a, a gentle 10 or 15 minute walk can help increase your body's sensitivity to the insulin that it's making uh, to help it be more potent and work uh, to bring your glucose back into target. So you said earlier, sometimes people don't want to check their glucose because they don't want to see the number. They're afraid of it being a quote unquote bad number. And I think that really stems from thinking about numbers as good or bad rather than kind of information that can guide your choices. How do you help people kind of change that mindset when it comes to the numbers? Well, diabetes is, is, is challenging in a way that we cannot know the number, but oftentimes our body is still sending us messages. So there are 
there are symptoms of uh, elevated glucose. It could be feeling really tired, a strong desire to take a nap. It could be uh, some some blurry vision. Uh, it could be some loss of concentration, uh, or just kind of a feeling of feeling blasé about what's what what the con what you're doing at that moment. So. While we might think ignorance is bliss and I don't want to check the numbers, there may be other symptoms that may be even increasing your fears even more around what the glucose numbers are. And sometimes having the numbers or knowing the numbers can be helpful uh, to, to stem some of that fear. So let's talk a little bit more about all or nothing thinking, because I think sometimes it can lead people to just quit trying to eat healthy because they feel like if I can't do it perfectly, I'm not going to try at all. How do you help people find kind of a more moderate, balanced approach? When people have a tendency to think about all or nothing thinking, that's where I really encourage bringing in curiosity. If I were to have a portion of something that I really enjoy, how does my body respond? If I were to have as much as what I would find satisfying of what I really enjoy, how does my body respond? And really working to build up body trust that you can predict and feel safe in your body and feel safe around how your body is going to be processing a food uh, so that you're not fearing any sort of um, thoughts about complications of diabetes or just feeling uncomfortable with numbers that are out of range. All right, I have many more questions for you about building that body trust, but I wanna take another break. Folks, in case you're just joining us, we're here with dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist, Nicole Patience, who's talking about having a healthy relationship with food and our bodies. And we're giving away a new guide to coping with emotional eating if you answer our trivia question, which is true or false, mindful eating can help us have a better relationship with food. Is that true or false? Can mindful eating help us have a better relationship with food? Put your best guess in the comments and you will get that guide delivered to your Facebook Messenger inbox. Folks, we do this show every month and we want to make sure you never miss an episode. Text the word WATCH to 833-520-1246 and we'll send a short text message to you when we go live each month. So some folks might not be familiar with the term mindful eating. How do you define it? What does eating mindfully look like? Mindful eating is bringing intention and attention to what we're eating, um, and it can look so many different ways. It could it could be you know stopping to think like, am I enjoying this food right now? Or it could be uh, is it slowing down a little bit. It could be even just turning off the screen while we're eating, uh, whether it's a phone or a, a show. Um, or it could just be something as simple as taking a little bit more time to check in with your body as you're eating as to how hungry and full you're feeling throughout the meal. So how can mindful eating be a tool that can kind of help people start enjoying food again? Well, sometimes there's foods that we might be choosing that we, through mindful eating and slowing down, realize you might not really like them that much, but they might be a food that, oh, it's kind of a trendy food, or it feels like a healthy food, or it feels like a high reward, like, oh, I really need this because I'm really stressed. But when someone is slowing down, they're thinking, am I enjoying this still? Um, so that could be that could be one way that it can be helpful. So if someone says, okay, I, I would like to you know, try mindful eating, where would you, you suggest that they start? Would it, would it be paying attention to hunger and fullness cues? Paying attention to hunger and fullness cues is a wonderful place to start, but it is really challenging. It is not easy if, if those have felt foreign or if you felt disconnected from your hunger and fullness cues. Uh, if somewhere every time before you start eating, if you were to give yourself a challenge of identifying how hungry am I, that might feel really complicated um, to start to slow down and really tune in with some of those nuanced feelings of hunger and fullness. Yeah, we can get the extremes, you know, I, I'm starving, I haven't eaten in hours, or, oh, I'm so full. But some of those more subtle cues really take a bit of time to, to perceive and to trust. And so I would say the biggest thing is, while it's absolutely invaluable to be in tune with your hunger and fullness cues, to be gentle with yourself in the process of starting to understand those and in starting to respect and honor those cues. 
What would you say to that person who says they often have the experience of being really hungry, starting a meal, eating, you know, and then suddenly feeling really full and like really not getting that cue in the middle that they were st starting to, to feel full? What would you say that they, they could start paying attention to? I would get really curious about if that's happening more with certain foods or if it's happening more in certain settings. Are there certain settings when you're eating with other people or on your own or distracted that where you tend to get caught up with realizing that you're feeling more full than you're than is comfortable. So you there's a possibility of building a pause into a meal after you know, five minutes or 10 minutes and kind of doing an assessment. But with that information, comes comes the opportunity to make that choice. And if you feel open to the idea of, gosh, I'm starting to get full, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna continue what I'm eating. I'm gonna save some for later. Um, it that can be a hard, a hard thing to do. So uh, a part of skill building. So can mindfulness help us with, you know, food triggers or cravings that we might frequently experience? Mindfulness can help us with food triggers because it can help us tease apart where a craving versus a hunger can be. So by really attuning to those different hunger cues, whether it's a mouth hunger, a hand hunger, um, a stomach hunger, um, and help us understand, okay, how am I, I'm, some, help us tease apart, I want to eat versus am I hungry? Because those could be different things. We, we eat for so many different reasons. We eat for comfort. We eat for to celebrate. We eat for, for to procrastinate another activity. We eat to, um, to connect with people. We eat when we're stressed, pause, for comfort for when we're stressed. We, um, there's so, you know, so many different reasons that we eat. And so mindfulness can help attune to helping to hone in on eating when we're hungry and then the other piece of mindful eating comes the work of identifying, I want to eat, meaning my body is expressing a need. And how can I meet that need given that I'm not hungry right now? So what can I, how am I, what am I feeling right now? What are the things that are coming up? And what would be some ways to do that? Is it, is it connecting with other people? Is it, you know, some sort of sensory, um, Thing like co cozying up in a blanket or giving a, a warm beverage, or uh, maybe we're just tired and we're wanting to eat for energy or for stimulation to stay awake. So maybe a, a, a short a short walk to, to help wake up your muscles. So there's there's different things that come up when we want to eat and we recognize after practicing mindfulness and mindful eating that we might not be hungry. So you used a term I've never heard before: hand hunger. What is hand hunger? Hand hunger is like, you know, you like, oh yeah, that looks good. That looks good. There's a wonderful book that explains the seven hungers and hand hunger is one of them where we just feel like we want to reach for, for some food. I was actually thinking it was going to be kind of that hand to mouth motion you get when you're eating something like something out of a bag of chips or something like that. <laughs> That's just where your hand almost takes on a life of its own. Absolutely. When we're not, when we're not working with intention, we're kind of on autopilot uh, with eating. That can absolutely be, that can happen. So let's talk a little bit about how our environment can sometimes trigger us to eat. So the classic example for me is snacking in front of the TV after dinner. How can people start to become aware of those situations where they might start overeating just out of habit? Uh, those activities where food is tethered to the activity, eating in front of the TV, snacking perhaps in the car, um, at the da at your desk at a certain time of the day where your body just starts to want to snack. And so untethering those activities, checking in with the, your body around hunger and fullness, but also part of it is recognizing at my last meal, was I satisfied at my last meal? If you find that you're getting hungry you know, less than three hours after eating, it may be a concern with, is your meal giving you what you want it to and doing what you want it to? And it may, if someone is not eating enough or not including a variety of foods, that all of a sudden they get hungry and then find themselves relying on snacks as opposed to those really nourishing foods that are part of the meal. So there's no easy one answer about this, but really making sure that it's not part of a bigger picture of restricting or not getting enough at meals and then having this um, 
the, the snacking at night as a result. Nicole, thank you so much for joining us. I have really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for having me, Ansley. And a big thank you to everyone watching at home. We so appreciate you being here and chatting with us in the comments. Before we go, here's the answer to tonight's trivia question. True or false, mindful eating can help us have a better relationship with food. The answer is true. If you didn't get to answer the trivia question, but you'd still like that guide for emotional eating, just leave a comment for us and tell us what you thought of the show. We will be back to you with a new episode in a few weeks. Until then, please stay safe and take good care. Good night.